What would you do if you sat down to enjoy your favorite movie when all of a sudden it was interrupted by screams from hell? And then we take a look at the story of a young girl who's raised by meth users. Both her mother and her father like to kick back, smoke a little meth. But just when you thought things couldn't get any worse, a new roommate appeared. A demon feeding off her parents' addiction. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. Hope you guys have some awesome plans for the weekend. Hope you guys got some cool stuff to do. We'll have a full week of Dead Rabbit Radio next week. This was a short week because of the Oregon Ghost Conference. But appreciate all of your guys' patience. But someone who has all the patience they need, plus more, running into Dead Rabbit Radio Command. Everyone get on your feet and give it up for our newest Patreon supporter, Dr. Mads. Woohoo! Yeah, we! <laughs> yeah, woohoo! Yeah, Dr. Mads is walking on in to Dead Rabbit Radio Command. Wearing scrubs. Dr. Mads, you're going to be our captain, our pilot of this episode. If you guys can't support the show financially through the Patreon or YouTube memberships or the merch store, that's totally fine. It really, really is. Just help spread the word about Dead Rabbit Radio. That helps out so much. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you know. Dead Rabbit Radio is your favorite paranormal show. Let's go ahead and get this party started. This might be a long episode. I might throw in a Dead Rap Radio Recommends at some point, too, just to make it five minutes longer. Dr. Mance, let's get this started. I'm going to go ahead and toss you the... Dr. Mance, I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys to the Hair Hovercraft. Everyone climb on board as Dr. Mads pilots us out of Dead Rap Radio Command all the way down to swampy, swampy Florida. <laughs> Hovercraft. Taking us off. <laughs> Jason, it sounds like a vacuum cleaner. Do you even know what a hovercraft sounds like? I just picture one of those giant ones from G.I. Joe. I don't even know if those are real. But anyways, Dr. Mads expertly at the commands. Specifically, we're headed to Maitland, Florida. We get to Maitland, Florida, and we walk up to the Enzian Theater. Enzian Theater. And I'm like, one ticket, please. One ticket, please, for Dune 2. And the clerk looks at us, and he goes, we don't play movies like that. And we're like, okay. Uh, one ticket to the beekeepers. <laughs> Jason Statham, he's like, if we're not showing Dune 2, bro, we're not showing the beekeeper. And I'm like, ah, what are you guys showing? What do you guys show at the NZN Theater? And that's when the ticket taker dude goes, lame stuff. We we watch a lot of lame stuff here, a lot of independent films. There's no Transformers. None of our movies have the words sorority or, or massacre. We have movies about, like, ducks. And, like, I don't know, probably a movie about an Algerian boy who builds a paper boat. It's three hours long. There's no dialogue. Hope you like to watch a boy fold paper. And I turn around and I'm like, oh, man, it's kind of lame because you figure... It should be a cool movie theater. And some people would argue that it is. Some people who know this theater will be like, Jason, this is one of the most prestigious independent theaters in the country. Yeah, but I mean, like, even that, you can only watch Pulp Fiction or Amelie so many times. And I never, I even saw Amelie once. I was like, ah, that looks dumb. I saw Pulp Fiction two or three times. But I was like, yeah, I get it, dude. But there's independent movies that are good. They tend to be horror movies. Um, not Boy Builds Boat, Triple B, currently playing at, Z- at the Enzian Theater. Enzian Theater, I could not find out what it was before it was a theater. I read about a lot about this place online, and I found one or two sources that were saying that there was something here before the theater. Before it was, I mean, obviously, if you go back to the time of dinosaurs, it was a jungle, it was a swamp. But... Like, I think it was originally a different building, but I couldn't really verify that. What we do know, though, is in 1985, it became the Enzian Theater, and they showed movies. They showed real movies for real people. Then a couple years later, about four years later, they said, you know what? We're tired of money raining down on us. We're tired of 
children of all ages walking out of this theater saying, wow, Return of the Jedi. It's pretty dope. No, we don't want that no more. We want to watch lame independent stuff. <laughs> the blacker and whiter, the better. So they change it to an art house theater. And it actually paid off for them. There must have not have been anything else going on <laughs> any weekend in Florida since. They became an art house theater showing these independent movies. And then eventually the people who are running the theater start the Florida Film Festival, which is considered one of the most prestigious film festivals in the world. They said it's ranked up there with like Sundance and the Cannes Film Festival. But that's not why we're here. That's not why we're here. We're not here to watch a bunch of lame movies. But we do buy tickets because we have to get in for this next part of the story. Fine, fine. Give me, give me a ticket to that movie about the guy who falls in love with a cake. It sadly it might be funny. It sounds like an Adam Sandler comedy. It's not. It's all in Russian. It's a tragedy. But we walk into the movie theater... We, I don't even know if they serve popcorn. I don't know if it's like that lame of a movie theater. They're like, no, popcorn is too popular. We sell soybeans. You like uncooked soybeans? Here you go. No, but we walk in the movie theater. We're carrying bags of uncooked soybeans. We kind of sit down in the chairs. And the movie starts. It's super dumb. Really, really boring. And I just keep checking my watch. Checking my watch. And I'm like, tick tock, bro. And you're like, so like is this movie, you want this movie to be over? And I was like, no, actually, we have to stay here until one in the morning. <laughs> we got here at three in the afternoon. It's a Lamo film festival. We're like, oh, Florida film festival. All the movies are about oranges and swamps. And we're like, ah. But anyways, we make it. We make it through all these orange-based documentaries. Now it's 12.59. And this new black and white movie starting. Dumb movies going on about some mom who lost her child. During some war. <laughs> I'm all boring. This, this movie sucks. Everyone's sobbing in the audience. I'm like, when? When's it going to be 1 a.m.? Anyways, eventually 1 a.m. happens. And I was like, here we go, guys. This will all be worth it. This will all be worth it soon. And all of a sudden, on the north corner of the room, all right, we're sitting in this movie theater. All of a sudden, you see a woman's head appear it's kind of floating there and then like, I mean, does, does it really have to be does it really have to be more to that story imagine any event you're ever at you're at a wedding you're watching a rugby match you're just walking down the street and a woman's head just appeared in front of you you're like that's it that's all i need of this story a woman's head magically appeared at the end this woman's head appears and then it starts screaming at the top of its lungs. Quite the feet, because it has none. This head is now floating there and it's going, ah, 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 and it's screaming super loud. And then there's even more to the story. It starts to float across the room, screaming the whole time, ah. Now, some stories, this is a very well-documented haunting in this area. Some stories has it fly to every corner in the room. Some say it just flies in a straight line from one end of the room to the other. It doesn't have to hit all four corners. <laughs> it would be terrifying either way. You're like, oh, that was kind of scary, but it just went in a straight line. It didn't hit all four corners of the room. 50% less scary. It's floating around screaming at the top of its lungs. And it will float around the room until it eventually hits a wall that the Enzian Theater shares with a restaurant called the Nicole St. Pierre. It floats through the wall and now you can hear it. You can hear it on the other side of the wall. It's now floating through the restaurant still screaming. And then it vanishes. Nobody knows who this head belongs to. Nobody knows where this came from. This is where I found a note where one of the people telling the story said the head actually predates the theater. They said the original building also had a problem with this screaming head. Which if that's the case, I hope they got a discount. I hope they got some rent knocked off. 
when they put a movie theater there, they're like, yeah, you know, a really good place. It's centrally located. There's a screaming head that appears every so often. It's 1 a.m. I left out a detail. I forgot about this. It's 1 a.m. on moonless nights. So still, that's like once a month. That's pretty good odds for a ghost. Sometimes you can have a place that's haunted and ghost researchers can go out there for weeks or months, just different groups over the course of a year, not experience anything. On a moonless night at one in the morning, you're in this theater, you can see the set float by. Also in my research, the Nicole St. Pierre may have moved. I think now the place is called the Eden Bar, but it's hard to pull up. I pulled this, this is one of those stories that I got off on the Shadowlands.net and I went to Google Earth and I was like looking at the layout. And it really is just like, it's not a movie theater out in the middle of nowhere. It's like right off of Main Street. But I couldn't really like get in. <laughs> I mean, generally Google Earth doesn't allow you to do like a third person view of like a guy with a crowbar breaking into the building and walking around. But you have this place that could still be, I found a business called the Nicole St. Pierre. I think that's moved though. There is a place called the Eden Bar that now shares this location with Enzi and Theater. But that's all quibbles, right? That's all quibbles. We're here to talk about a screaming head. Who lives next door to it isn't the big deal. But what's interesting, so we have a repeated haunting. This is interesting for a couple different reasons. One, we have a repeated haunting. It's something that if you live in the area, you could probably try to do you should you might be able to go see this you might have to wait till there's a midnight moving of the life cycle of a grub you'll have to be there it's, it's shot in real time it's a three month long movie but if you're there at one in the morning on a moonless night maybe you'll see this head come flying by if you're in the if you're in the area you actually might be familiar with this story i also think it's terrifying we've talked about this before on the show as far as i can recall and I may be off by about three or four, but as far as I can recall, there's just one other story of a screaming head. And if there are more out there, I'd say it's still less than 10. There, We see a lot of ghosts without heads, but to actually have a floating head flying around, incredibly rare. Uh, there is one of my favorite ghost stories. I think it was in Arizona or New Mexico. I'll put the episode in the show notes, but it's the same thing. People in this hotel, they'd see a screaming head appear. That one, I believe, might have been had like blood coming out of the neck wound. This head, I don't remember for sure. <laughs> that might just be my gruesome memory. This head appearing and screaming at people in this hotel. I'll put that episode in the show notes. The reason that why that's one of my favorite scary stories because it's so terrifying. There's not much that beats a screaming head appearing. There's really not. I I would imagine a blood-soaked ghost. That that would rank up there as well. A ghost who's chasing you with like a pickaxe or a ghost chainsaw. A guy running around at you trying to chop you up. Obviously, those rank high as well. But the screaming ghost head's scary just because of the visual. Uh, we don't, <laughs> generally people don't go, I mean, here's the thing. I will often see people walk around and I could go, oh, I can imagine that person bathed in blood. I would not, I, <laughs> to be fair, I don't think that often. You're like, oh, okay, I'm going to call the authorities on Jason. That's kind of bizarre. I don't think that often, but I could. I, it would be hard for me to be talking to someone and they're like, hey, Jason, what's up? I was like, oh, not much, man. How you doing? We're talking and I'm just thinking, I wonder what they're, <laughs> Be like if their head was just floating there and they were screaming. You can picture a person covered in blood. We've seen that in more than enough horror movies. It's just them. They're like, one got oil changed Jiffy Lube and then it went Safeway. And they're all gesticulating. You're imagining blood flying everywhere as they're talking with their hands. Um, But the next time you're talking to like a coworker or a friend or a loved one, just imagine their head. Floating there, screaming at you. You create this tulpa, you can't get it out of your head. You're like, oh, no, why do I do stuff? Why do I do stuff Jason says? It's a lot creepier because it's not something we're used to seeing is human heads. If I can imagine a guy chasing me with a chainsaw, I've seen enough horror movies. I've seen real people with chainsaws cutting down trees. (laughs) I'm not going to be like, oh, boring. As he's like chasing me down a hallway. It's like, oh, it's been there, done that. This is lame. But I don't even see... I've seen human heads. I've seen decapitated human heads because I used to work at a crematory. But um, I've probably seen more than most people. I would still argue that a floating human head 
is one of the most terrifying things you could see. And the fact that it's screaming. Because then you just imagine it's in this horrific pain in the afterlife. If it was just like floating there, and it's, it all turns and it's all watching the movie. Woo, it's like floating, it's a block in your view. You're like, get out of the way. You're throwing soybeans at the back of its head. If it was just like floating there looking at you, less scary. Because then you go, well, you know, maybe maybe getting your head chopped off isn't the worst thing that could happen to you. But the fact that it's screaming is the worst. Again, what's what would be scarier? Waking up in the middle of the night and there's a little girl at the foot of your bed with pitch black eyes staring at you. Or waking up in the middle of the night, there's a little girl at the foot of your bed with normal eyes, but she's screaming at the top of her lungs. Like, which one? <laughs> well, one's going to wake up the neighbors. Um, the the black eyed kid is way less creepy, even though you can go, oh, that's not a real kid. The one that's screaming, you might think, is actually a real kid. It might be your kid. <laughs> it might be screaming for help. The house might be on fire, and you're like, oh, I heard about this on Dead Rap Radio. That's just an illusion. You're falling back to sleep. So, yeah, it's super creepy. A ghost story. I like it. And I also like the fact that it's repeatable. You guys can go check this out. What I find interesting too is I, I've thought about this before. I don't want to go into too much because I got a lot to talk about on the next story. But here's something that I've always wondered. I'm a huge fan of horror movies. I wonder why people don't make horror movies. Like let's say I'm an independent director and I'm making a movie called like Blood Soaked Creek. About a bunch of teenagers who camp out on Blood Soaked Creek. And then like the ghost of this vengeful hillbilly arises from the mud and kills them off one by one. Basic slasher movie. I'm surprised that you have don't you haven't had this happen yet. A director goes, hey, we're gonna make this movie. It's called Blood Soaked Creek. It's gonna be a standard slasher movie, but I'm gonna use real dead bodies. I'm not going to kill people on the set of my movie. But when people get killed for... You can do it a couple different ways. One, you could have like the hillbilly throw like a lantern at somebody. Like an oil lantern. He uses all these hillbilly-based weapons. <laughs> He's all spraying moonshine in people's faces. They're going blind. They're all... He throws an oil lamp at one of the teenagers and it explodes and the teenager catches on fire. And then you cut to real footage of somebody burning to death. It's a real person dying. You go, Jason, that'd be a little weird. The film quality totally changes. It changes from this um, horror movie cinematography to like footage news footage from 1997 you're like yeah it's kind of weird that a uh, guy was running away from the hillbilly and then all of a sudden he appeared in downtown los angeles and uh he was on fire i didn't really understand that part i mean you would have to do some selective editing or because it would be shocking that that's the thing and there are listen there's horror movie directors that do stuff for like a24 there's horror movie directors who do stuff for blumhouse i'm not talking about that there are horror movie directors that make stuff like vomit dolls. They already do these really disgusting movies. Gateway meat. I'm surprised that when you go to that really low budget... Because uh, vomit murder doll... whatever I never saw it, but it pops up on IMDb. Vomit gore people or vomit murder dolls. The people are actually vomiting in the movie. <laughs> I mean, you're like, well, that's a movie I'll never watch. Thanks, Jason. I've never seen it either. I have no interest in it. There's a whole genre of movies that are horror movies about people vomiting. And they, the people really vomit in the movie. I'm surprised if you're that on the edge. That's not, that's not even on the edge. You've fallen straight off at that point. You're just making some weird smut. Um, you're making a really low-budget horror movie. You cut to people dying in real life. It would be so shocking. You Your brain wouldn't be able to process it. It would be the scariest thing you'd ever seen because you wouldn't expect it. And then I thought, I mean, you, you might have a hard time getting away with that because obviously, you know, film quality changes and things like that and, and moral, moral issues as well. You know, you're not an evil person. But I've also thought, you know, you could have a normal horror movie. Let's say this is like a Blumhouse movie and they're like, Megan 2, we're going to push it to the limit. 
We're actually going to make a <laughs> we're actually going to make a good movie this time as opposed to the first one, and we want it to be super scary. So when Megan kills somebody, they show like for one tenth of a second a photograph of a real dead body. And I don't even think you would pick up on it at first. But you would feel really unsettled. And you'd be like, wow, that movie... The movie was, <laughs> the movie was super disturbing. I don't know why. It was kind of weird. Should have been dumb like the first one. Um, Super gross. And people are like, well, yeah, I mean, it's about a robot girl beating people up. You're like, yeah, but there was something about it. It was more disturbing than that. I'm not saying to do the... Right now, there's a director writing down notes real quick. He's like, oh, man, this is awesome. I'm so glad I listened to this podcast. I'm not saying people should do it. I'm surprised nobody has done it. Now, I know there are movies that are just collections of videos of people dying. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a normal horror movie with a normal plot and then intercut into the movie there are scenes of real people dying. It would be so off-putting and disturbing, and I think even more so if your brain didn't register it. You, you would have to have people start watching it frame by frame to pick up on them. And as far as I know, I know England has different laws, but gore is not illegal in the United States. You you never be able to show it in a movie theater due to obscenity laws because you know obviously to get like an NC you would get like an NC thirty seven you'd have to be at least forty years old to watch it but um yeah I'm just I've never come across that and you know I watch movies like Antrim which is supposedly we talked about it a long time ago but it's a cursed movie and it's a decent film I actually like Antrim but it's not cursed they kind of put that mythology that meta story on top of it. But I think it's interesting that that movie would intercut with demonic symbols or like symbols of the cult of Antrim or whatever it was. It's been years since I've seen it. Blair Witch Book of Shadows kind of did the same thing. I'm surprised people haven't done that. Shoot a horror movie and in the middle of it you have a screaming head flying around. And then like the guy jumps out and he hits the head with a baseball bat. And then for a split second you cut to a real photo of someone's head getting hit with a baseball bat. Again, not I'm not saying do it. I'm not saying this is a good idea. I'm saying I'm surprised nobody has done it yet. I've even thought about if you took, if you played with the Uncanny Valley a little bit, we know that there are certain animated or CGI facial features that makes us feel really uncomfortable. I go, I'm surprised they haven't had a horror movie with a villain where they do that. They kind of did it with that old movie, Smiley. But to really go for it, you take a, you take the villain and you actually digitally manipulate his eyes or in his mouth. It still looks normal, but you change it enough that it kicks in that uncanny valley factor. So when you're watching the movie, you feel really disturbed and you don't know why. You're, you don't understand why because it's not it doesn't look CGI. It doesn't look fake. And they just go and they digitally change things. So whenever the killer is on screen, you feel physically uncomfortable. I'm surprised people haven't done that. That'll probably happen before the other one. I'm sure people will do that before they start intercutting gore into movies, which is a good thing. I just want to be very, very clear. I'm not encouraging that. Dr. Mads, let's go ahead and toss you the keys to the world. Famous Carpenter Copter, we're leaving behind Florida. Fly us all the way out to Montana. <laughs> and I think I have a little time for this. While we are flying out to Montana, I want to do a very, very quick Dead Rabbit Radio recommends. There is a movie on Amazon Prime right now called An Ideal Host. Watch it. Dead Rabbit Radio recommends An Ideal Host. I'm not going to tell you anything about it. That is the best way to go into it. I read the little blurb on Amazon. And even then, I didn't really know what the movie was about. The trailer doesn't tell you anything that the movie's about. At a certain point, I think like in a month or two, if I remember, I will do a spoiler Dead Rabbit Radio recommends of that movie. But right now, if you're looking for something to watch, if you have Amazon Prime, An Ideal Host. It's basically about a woman trying to host this big party for all of her friends. That's what the description says. That's what the trailer is. 
Dead Rabbit Radio recommends An Ideal Host. Fantastic film. I'm not going to say anything else about it, at least for a couple months. Give you guys time to watch it. We're headed all the way out to Montana. Uh, The year is 2011-2012. We're about to stop by a RV. There's an RV parked out behind a home. And inside that RV is a family. We're going to meet a young daughter. Let's call her Tabitha. She has two siblings, a mother and a stepfather. This RV belongs to her stepfather, and it is parked in the back of the stepfather's parents' house, and they're all living here. Tabitha is not a real name, but that's what we'll call her. Tabitha said, you know, this we lived in the middle of this medium-sized town in Montana. Things were pretty good for a while, but I don't know if her biological father passed away or left before this whole situation started, but she said, uh, my mom ended up dating this new guy and he became my stepdad. And part of him joining the family was he had a really serious meth problem and that spread to my mom. So now my mom is using meth all the time and we're living in this RV in the back of my step-grandparents' house. Which is a step up from where she was. Tabitha, for a while, they were homeless. They were living in a car. But now they have this RV to stay in. And it's not the best place to stay. I mean, RVs are basically built to like go on vacation with. They're definitely not... I don't think they're generally built to for long-term living. Definitely not five people living in an RV. This RV also had a serious problem. It constantly smelled... Like a decaying corpse. (laughs) There's a lot of smells you can kind of taint. You're like, oh, you know, that doesn't smell good. It smells like mold or it smells like stale food. But smelling like a decaying corpse, (laughs) there's not much you can get worse than that. It didn't always smell like a decaying corpse. It didn't always smell like rotting flesh. But again, how many times would that have to happen before you're like, okay, this place sucks. This place sucks. I don't want to live here. Mom and stepdad are constantly using meth. That's probably also not helping the smell. Gross. Meth smells like... Meth smells exactly like you think it would smell. It smells like dangerous chemicals. It smells like just raw, unadulterated poison. Like and an, on an industrial scale. Tabitha just has to deal with it, right? She's a kid. I don't know exactly how old she is. I think she's preteen, somewhere around there. But you know, life isn't all bad. One day her stepdad comes home. This is a story only a this is a story only a meth user could say, oh, that happened to me. One day her dad came home and he was holding a kitten. He's petting the kitten, and the kids are super excited, and they're like. Dad, Dad, where'd you get the kitten at? And he goes, well, a hobo gave it to me. A hobo had a box full of kittens. And I was walking by and he asked me, would I want one? And I said, sure. So I got, got a free kitten. <laughs> I know people do get free kittens from boxes. I just imagine, what was this hobo doing with them? I imagine he had his own cat and it got pregnant. And he's like, well, Bertha, I can't feed all these kittens. I can barely keep you and me fed. Looks like your babies are going to go in a box. Hopefully hopefully a meth user will walk by and want one of them. And this family, they love this kitten. We're going to call him Mittens the Kitten. And Tabitha says we all loved him. He was a pretty dope cat. So it started to get really weird when Tabitha would come home from school some days and Mittens wouldn't be in the RV. Well, first off, Mittens hated being in the RV. She goes, it was so hard getting him in there. He did not like it. But, you know, he's a little cat, a little cat guy. He has to stay in the RV sometimes. He's probably outdoor, indoor. Obviously, if you want to pet him, too. You know, you don't want to stand outside petting a cat in the rain. They have a really hard time getting Mittens to even hang out in the RV. But sometimes when Tabitha comes home, she'll be like, Mittens, Mittens. Where are you, Mittens? And she hears a... "Mm." 
She's like, what? And she's like looking around. She's like, where in the world are you, Mittens? And she opens the door to the RV. And she hears a muffled meowing coming from somewhere. And she's like, huh? What? And she realizes that Mittens is locked in one of the cabinets in the RV. My grandparents had one, so I'm familiar with it. Tabitha pointed this out a well. To prevent all of your dishes, to prevent all of your dishes and all of your silverware flying out at any moment while you're driving the RV down the road. Uh, generally, I think they all have to do this. I think it's a safety thing. The cabinets have a latch system. It's not just like a knob you open up in your kitchen. Your kitchen's not in constant danger of getting T-boned. So they're just like the force of gravity is how you close your cabinets in a house. But on an RV, there's these latches. So if you take a sharp corner, you get hit by something, you don't have a whole tray of forks and knives flying across the room. And she would undo the latch and mittens would jump out of the cabinet and run outside. And this is what she was trying to figure out because it would happen a lot. Mittens would get locked in the cabinets. And she goes, first off, my stepdad loved mittens. My stepdad would not do that, meth or not. He would not lock the cat up. This is not something he would do. She goes, also, mittens couldn't be doing it because of the latching system. Basically, the cat would have to undo the latch Walk in, and then the latch redo itself. Cat's stuck multiple times. Listen, cats like to get into tight spaces. They like to get in trouble. I've seen Heathcliff as well. But most cats don't have thumbs. I think all real cats don't have thumbs. They can't undo latches and then also redo the latch after they're already locked inside. So that was something that Tabitha thought was weird. Other people thought it was weird too. Why is the cat getting locked in here? Tabitha also said every morning she would wake up with scratches. And so would her brother. He'd wake up with scratches on him. I mean, mom would say it's just a cat. <laughs> it's a pretty good deduction right there. Cat doesn't want to be in the RV. You fall asleep. Cat's scratching you up. Uh, but Tabitha never really bought that. She said it looked like the scratches came from a human hand as opposed to cat scratches. But that's something she can never really say one way or the other. Same thing with mittens getting locked in the cabinet. You couldn't verifiably say it wasn't this. It was just like, it was most likely not my dad. He would never do that. One morning, everyone's waking up to go about their business. Tabitha and her siblings are getting ready for school. Mom is packing another pipe full of meth. And dad, stepdad, we'll call him Joey. We'll give him a name now. Joey, the stepdad, wakes up. He's laying in bed and he goes to get up and he goes... Uh, uh, what? Uh, uh, I can't move. Uh, uh, honey, honey, come over here. I, I, I can't move. I can't move. I'm stuck. Uh, and Tabitha's just in there and she's like, okay. Like, he's obviously... He's obviously I mean, having some sort of bad reaction to the meth that he's constantly smoking. She also said my dad had back problems. And she's sitting there and she's watching him and he's just like laying prone on the bed in the RV. And he's going, I can't move. I can't move. And Tabitha's like, oh my God. Like, can't I just have one normal day? <laughs> and she goes and she unlocks the cabinet, gets mittens out. She goes, can I have one normal day? Her scratches are still bleeding on her skin. Her dad says, I can't move. I'm frozen in bed. This goes on for a week. And I imagine Tabitha going to school. And she's doing her homework in the cafeteria. And they're like, hey, Tabitha, why are you doing your homework at school? You should be eating lunch. And she goes, well, you know, it's really hard concentrating at home <laughs> because my dad is frozen they're like what yeah my dad's frozen in bed he only does a scream about it all day long oh no i can't move i'd rather just do my homework at school tabitha for a week her father was stuck to his bed and he would tell people because they'd be like just get up dude it's just your back hurts maybe you threw your back out maybe you did too much meth Whatever it is, just sit up, get out of bed. And he's like, I can't move. I can't get out of bed. 
Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start using that excuse. He said he felt like something was pressing down on him. And Tabitha goes, we tried getting him out of bed, but we couldn't. And, you know, we're kids and he's an adult and he's <laughs> he's just laying there. He's not helping at all. He's like, oh, I'm paralyzed. Bring the television closer and give me some more meth and a bedpan. That was one thing I was thinking, like, if you were frozen in place in a bed for a week. I I don't know if his bowels were frozen as well. Like, was he pooping the bed? And he was a meth. He was a meth head. So I imagine that he was still smoking meth in bed. Like his wife would be like putting the pipe to his lips. And he's like, that's some good meth. Oh, yeah, thank you, honey. <laughs> I'm trapped. I'm trapped. Now he's like extra energized. He can scream even louder. He's tweaking hella hard in bed. For a week, he's stuck in bed. I imagine if, I wonder if his wife was like, oh, time for bed. And she like lays down next to him. She's getting the best sleep of her life. He's like, ah, I'm still trapped. After about a week goes by, the mom is like, okay, we, we got to take care of this. I'm assuming he's pooping the bed the whole time. Tabitha said, I watched mom grab him and basically put all of her strength into lifting him off of the bed. I don't know why she didn't do this on Monday. I don't know why it took a week. Maybe before then she was just trying every once in a while, but she's really putting the effort in this time. She's trying to pull him up and he's screaming and he's crying. Oh no, don't, I'm frozen. Ah! And um, the mom said that it felt like he was 50 pounds heavier and she just can't get a good grip on him. And then finally, after about 20 minutes of constant pulling, she's able to get him up out of bed and then helps him walk out of the RV. And he takes a couple steps down and now is outside of the RV and he stretches. He stretches a bit and then goes, whoa, you know, like relaxes his muscles. And then he was totally fine. He's like, wow, <laughs> we could have done that on Monday. We could have done that on Monday. Instead, I just screamed and screamed. So at this point, again, she's thinking, Tabitha goes, was that a ghost? Or was my dad just lazy? <laughs> the, the immortal question. Your dad's just sitting there in a chair all day long. You're like, oh, no, my dad's a ghost. He's like, no, I'm just retired. She didn't think it was weird. It was another thing that went into that weird bucket. But really, all of this stuff culminates into this. One day, Tabitha is sitting with her sister in the RV and her dad sitting on the couch. They have a couch that pretty much runs the entire length of the RV. He's sitting on the couch. And then there's this chair next to the couch and mom is sitting on the arm of the chair. And they're both completely spun. They're totally tweaked out and they're talking to each other. And then the stepdad, Joey, starts talking to the chair. In this very, very rapid pace. At this very, very rapid pace. And Tabitha sees that her father is now not talking to mom. He's actually talking to the chair. And Tabitha looks over, and sitting in the chair is a woman that she's never seen before. Tabitha's never seen this woman before. She doesn't even remember her walking into the RV. And, and to be fair, Tabitha did say at the end of her story, I'll put it in here now, she goes, they smoked a lot of meth. And there is a chance that... I was getting a contact high, for lack of a better term. Basically, she was breathing in toxins and poisons as well. Tabitha goes, that is possible. They were smoking a lot of meth in an RV. It's possible I was getting some of those vapors as well. But she's sitting there in this RV. Tabitha's sitting there with her sister. She looks and she sees this woman sitting in this red chair. And she goes, I've never seen her before. I don't even remember her coming in. She goes, my dad was talking to her, and the woman would just occasionally nod. And then the dad would go back talking to the mom, and they'd be all spun out talking to each other, the two parents. And then the dad would go back and talk to the woman in the chair. And I believe the mother was also talking to the woman in the chair at certain points during this conversation. And Tabitha goes, oh, this is probably their drug dealer. 
I've never seen this person before. This must be their drug dealer. The woman that Tabitha saw was dressed in all black, wearing a, what she described, it was a black dress, but she described it as looking like a lacy 80s prom dress, but less uh, puffy. A little more stylish, less puffy, a black lace prom dress from the 80s. Uh, The woman had white skin, messy hair, but also it looked neat. Like it was supposed to be messy. It was stylized to be messy. She also described her face as, quote, messed up. And I don't know if that means that this woman's face had scars on it. Or she had a hard time um, determining features because she then described the woman's face as having, quote, unquote, fuzzy eyes. And it looked like the woman had been crying. So when she says it was messed up, she didn't go into detail. I don't think it was scarred or a monster face. It could have just been there was something off about it. Talking about the Uncanny Valley, something was off about her face. And she goes that this woman never said a word. She just sat in the chair. And when the father would talk to her, and yeah, the mother would also turn and talk to this woman. She would just nod. She would listen to what they were saying. And she would just sit there and nod. Later on, Tabitha brought this story up to her sister. When the, when this is also going on, not years later, Tabitha mentioned it to her sister. She's like, dude, what's up with that crazy lady? And the sister also said, I don't know who that was. That was really weird. She got a really weird feeling from the whole exchange as well. So they end up at a certain point asking their parents. They go, hey, hey mom, dad, what was up with that lady? That woman you guys were talking to, and they're like, what are you talking about? And they said, well, you know, the other day when you guys were just sitting there, I don't know how often they called out their parents for being tweakers, being meth heads, but um, you, that time where you were sitting on the couch and mom was on the chair, there was that woman who was sitting in, in the red chair. You guys were talking to her. She didn't say anything, but, you know, you guys were talking to her. And Joey, the stepfather, and the mom freak out because there was no woman in the chair no one by that description had come into that house come into that rv he doesn't remember talking to her at all he remembers talking with mom the mom remembers talking with him but they don't remember a third party being there they don't remember turning to the chair and talking they have no idea what's going on If there's one thing that unites meth heads, it's their paranoia. So now they're like completely freaked out. They are really wondering what could possibly be going on. And they're assuming that it is something evil. Something supernatural. After that conversation, it freaked um, them out so much. They said, let's go get some fresh air. Let's, Let's put down the meth. Come on, kids, we're going to go to the park. Let's get some fresh air. They have no idea what was going on. Because the the, the two kids did talk to him about that that day or the next. It wasn't like a long time after the event. They brought it back up. So mom, dad, the kids, they all go to the park and they're there for a while. When they come back, the streetlights are on. It's a bit darker. They're coming back to the RV Tabitha said the way that they, you know, because this was their house, they lived in it all the times, they always kept the curtains closed. Because you want a little bit of privacy. (laughs) You don't want everyone to know you're smoking meth and you have kids in there. It's against the law. You get your kids taken away. Um, The curtains are always closed on the RV as they're walking back. And that was especially helpful at night because the streetlights, one of them shone directly in to one of the windows of the RV. So if you had the curtain open, you could, you'd be kept up all night because the light was so bright the light shined right in they come back from the park it's dark out the street lights are on they're walking towards the rv and that is when they notice that one of the curtains of the rv is open and it's never open they never open these up and the family kind of stops as they're walking out there coming to a stop Tabitha notices something, and I believe it catches the attention of the rest of her family members. 
there's something really off about the RV other than the curtain being open because the street light is shining directly into the RV through this window. But when you look through that window, you see nothing but pitch blackness inside the RV. Even though the light of the street lamp should have illuminated the interior of the RV, it was pitch black. It was like an endless void inside the RV. They couldn't see in they couldn't see inside of it. Tabitha wrote, quote, it was like an energy had taken over in there and was waiting with welcome arms for us to go back in and feed off of the negatives. It stayed that way for a week. And we didn't go back for that long. She said for that week, they lived in their car like they had done previously. They waited until this feeling left. Tabitha said that she saw the woman one more time after all of this. They were having a bonfire. They had this fire pit going on outside. And again, her parents were completely geeked out, spun. They're super high and they're just talking. And every so often they would turn and they would look outside of the illumination of the fire pit. The parents are there. The kids are gathered around the fire pit. But outside of that circle... It's the dark of night. She said her parents would be talking and then they would turn and they would speak to something standing in the darkness. And when Tabitha looked over to see what they were to see who they were talking to, to see what they were talking to, she goes, I saw that woman standing just outside of the light. And every so often she would just nod her head. Nod her head and agree with what these meth heads were saying. It's a fascinating story. It's one that honestly we, I think in our gut, feel can be true. This was posted online by someone going by the name Sublime Junkie 4. She posted it and she goes, you know, there's parts that I don't remember. I just kind of had a messed up childhood. Um, we don't have any conclusion as to whether or not the parents ever got off meth. I mean, that would be the best thing, right, if they got clean and stopped putting this junk inside of their bodies. But, um, you know, it happened 12 years ago. We don't know how the story ends or if it continues. But as far as we know, as far as she knows, that was the last time she saw that woman. And it's a story that, like I said, I think it's something we believe can be true. And that is the idea of negative energies, negative entities being drawn to people with serious addiction problems, or people who are at risk of falling into addiction. I've talked about this a ton of times on the show. I'm not going to preach about it again. But basically, it is this idea, whether it's a gambling addiction, a pornography addiction, a meth addiction, whatever, sex addiction, alcoholism, the idea that some of these could be either caused by, or if not caused by, amplified by demonic or evil forces. I'm not saying everyone who's a gambling addict became a gambling addict because a demon made him. But I do imagine that casinos are full of dark energy. Bars full of dark energy. Street corners where these drugs, these poisons are being sold. Dark energy. Because it's drawn to that, right? We talk about these entities feeding off of our louche, feeding off of our negative emotions or positive emotions as well, whichever one it, it wants, creating these scenarios where we're trapped. And it's not just the drug, it's not just the addiction, but it's also everything that comes along with that. The shame, the guilt, the fear, all of this stuff is just so delicious for these entities. This is a type of story that... I think a lot of people go, that that could be true. Whether or not you believe her actual story, that's up to you. But I think it's I, I think it's probably pretty accurate. 
I just have her award to go off of. Um, and the fact that I go through the posting history and see if they post a lot of crazy stuff. And this is, again, she goes, this is really my only paranormal experience. I don't even know. And what's super interesting about this, too, is that she says, I have two memories. I have two memories. And this, again, is part of the really weird thing about the world of the paranormal. She goes, I remember sitting there and watching my parents turn and talk to that woman in the chair. She goes, I totally remember that. Dad's on the couch. Mom's on the arm of the chair. This woman sitting in the chair. Mom and dad talk to each other. Every so often they turn and talk to the chair and the woman would nod. She goes, I remember that. And then I also have another memory of the exact same moment in time. Mom and dad are talking to each other and every so often they'll turn and they'll talk to the chair, but there is no one in the chair. She goes, I remember both. I remember both memories. And that's something that I've personally experienced. That's something we've talked about on this show. I remember once I was at an apartment complex. It was my apartment complex. The place was haunted. I went in. I had to pick some stuff up. I was in the process of moving. I went in to get some stuff. I remember feeling a presence outside. I'm pretty sure I've told this story before. I remember feeling this presence outside of the bathroom door. I opened the bathroom door. There was nothing there. And I was like, we got to go. We got to go. I was with my old friend, Liz. We grabbed some stuff. We took off. She's like, what's the matter? And I go, I don't know what's the matter. But there's something there. And then a period of time passed. I don't remember if it was a couple months or a year or whatever. I then remembered what was standing outside that door. It was a child with no face. Not no face like it was flat. No face like it was... The skin was ripped off. So I had two memories of the same event. The one that I saw where my brain goes, nah, dude, we're not going to show you this image. It's too terrifying. It kicked in the animal instinct to leave the area, but I basically had two memories of the event. One where I opened the door and there's nothing there. and One where I opened the door and the kid's standing there. So I understand that was another reason why I was like, this is probably a pretty accurate She's probably a pretty accurate event because I've personally experienced that as well. You have two memories of one event. But it's a super creepy story. Like, on the one hand, you definitely feel bad for all the kids in this situation growing up in a house like that, in a, in a place like this. But imagine, too, adding on top of it a haunting. It's messing with your cat, scratching you in the middle of the night. And then you have this woman that is feeding off of these people. And and that's another interesting thing. We'll wrap it up like this because I could just go on and on. This is one of those stories that I think we could just break down for the next 15, 20 minutes. We'll wrap it up like this. I think it's absolutely terrifying because when people do get geeked out, listen, I grew up around methamphetamines, not my nuclear family, but my extended family. A lot of meth users. I grew up around methamphetamine. I grew up around meth dealers. I grew up around meth users. I've never used meth. I think it's absolutely disgusting. I've been around it. I know what it smells like. You have to be insane to put it in your body. It would be like opening up a bottle of bleach, taking a big whiff and going, yeah, I want that in my veins. It's horrifying. People do it, though. I know people personally who do it. It would not shock me out of all of the drugs out there that... Meth is the favorite of evil. That meth users are the most targeted by demonic forces. It would not shock me at all. I know ayahuasca and DMT can take you on these crazy trips. I understand that cocaine or, or cocaine is a euphoric drug. It's very expensive. I've never done that either. Crack cocaine can completely not just ruin your life. It can devastate communities. Heroin leads to fentanyl, which leads to trank. Not necessarily the user's choice, but when the dealer changes what they're selling and you're addicted, next thing you know, you're picking your exposed brain out standing in a parking lot. I have a video of that. It's super creepy. I don't know why I have that video saved. It's absolutely disgusting. A woman's skull has rotted to the point that you can see. I don't know if it's actually her brain, but it looks like brain, and she's picking at it. Disgusting. So... Now that you have that, you're sitting down, getting ready to eat some macaroni and cheese, you're all yummy, yummy, yummy. But there's something about meth. I don't know if it's because it's so industrialized. It's something that was created in a laboratory. I know ephedra comes from a plant, but methamphetamine, like the 
what's processed today. It's not like you're growing a sea of poppies out in the middle of Afghanistan. It's not like you are harvesting coca plants somewhere in South America, and then it's being processed in such a way that some football player at Rutgers University can invite a bunch of girls over and they all do blow. I'm not saying those are good things, but I'm saying there is a difference, I feel, between the two. I just feel like evil is more attracted to methamphetamine users. I don't. I feel like there's a missing link there as to why, but I think it might be because it is so man-made. It's so removed from the natural order. That and it is rotting your brain. It's poisoning your body. I'm sure evil loves that. There's a huge crossover too. I mean, you type in meth Satanism into Google, you're going to get the craziest hits. You see a lot of that. There's that slogan, that meme, smoke meth and worship Satan or smoke meth and love Satan and all this stuff. There's this uh, combination of trying to get, and I'm not talking like Satan worshipers as in a established religion not that type of saint worshipers people who actually worship satan as an individual not as an idea that's against the modern christian society no they actually love satan they're doing meth do meth and hail satan all this stuff so i mean it wouldn't shock me you it would not shock me if this story was true it would not shock me. what would shock me is if this story and only this story is true I wonder how often this is happening. Because you had the two people on meth conversating with this entity, whatever it was. But then you had the two kids able to see it from basically a third party point of view and then tell them, hey, you were talking to this person in the chair. If you're just smoking meth by yourself at home or with your friends and you're all smoking meth, that woman or something like that could be in that room as well. And none of you are going to remember it ever. You need a third party that is not engaged in methamphetamine use to see this thing. So I would be shocked if this is the only time this has happened. This could be happening every single day across the world. Meth users totally spun out, having a good time, in their point of view, not mine, having a good time, staying up late, fixing carburetors, Watching eight hours of Pawn Stars. And every so often they turn and they mumble a few words excitedly over their shoulder. And then they go back to taking the lawnmower apart at three in the morning. They won't remember that they just had a conversation with a invisible force standing behind them. They won't remember it every single time they do that. When they're lost in the meth cloud. And there are creatures from the darkness coming to feed off of them. And they never remember it. They don't even know what they're saying to these creatures. But whatever they're saying, these dark forces seem to agree with it because they always stand there listen to what you have to say and then nod their head you may not remember what you said but think about what evil depraved things must have come out of your mouth to make a spirit who dwells in the depths of hell nod their head in agreement. DeadRabRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. TikTok is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, and I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great weekend, guys.